Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 33 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by actual FBI cases. In this episode, we get to speak to Jane Rhodes Wolf. Now, Jane served with the FBI for 20 years. Early in her career, she was assigned to the New York field office where she worked financial investigations. And as a member of the Evidence Response Team, ERT, a collateral duty, she was deployed to Yemen following the bombing of the U.S. coal and on 9-11 responded to the World Trade Center attacks and aided victims. Jane eventually became a member of the Pent Bomb or Pentagon Bombing Investigative Team and she also worked on the investigation of terrorist Zacharis Mazawi. In addition to management assignments at FBI headquarters and congressional affairs and inspections, Jane began to concentrate on national security matters. She supervised a joint terrorism task force in Chicago and oversaw the intake and analysis of suspicious activity reports. In this episode, she's interviewed about one of those reports, which resulted in the investigation of an attempted purchase of a restricted toxin referred to as the pufferfish poison case. During the interview, she also provides tips for the public regarding potential threat indicators of suspicious activities that should be reported to law enforcement. Jane's last assignment prior to her retirement was section chief of the exploitation threat section in the counterterrorism division. Now, I want to tell you a little bit more about this pufferfish poison case, but I don't want to give anything away. The reason this person attempted to get a hold of this toxin is so bizarre, what he planned to do with it, so evil. And so uh, I just want you to be able to listen to that and just be amazed as Jane tells this fascinating story as it all unfolds and you get an idea of, you know, how, I don't know what else to say, but demented this person's mind was. But before we get to that interview, I saw your review, Ben. Thank you so much. Ben was thrilled when I was able to get a retired agent on the show to talk about cybercrime. So just give me an idea of what other topics you'd like to discuss. I reach out to members of the Society of Former FBI Agents, uh, our ex-agents group, and put feelers out for people that might have interesting cases. I like the old school stuff, the bank robberies, the kidnappings, and uh, drug gang cases. And so I hope to have more of those in the future too. This has been a busy week. As most of you know, I am uh, releasing my debut novel, my crime fiction about a female FBI agent investigating corruption in the Philadelphia strip club industry. It's called Pay to Play. It comes out on September 20th, and I am nervous. If you're in the Philadelphia area, check out my Facebook page, Jerry Williams Author, uh, later in the week where I will announce the fabulous location where I will be having my book launch party. All right, so anyway, that's enough about Jerry Williams and her book, Pay to Play, coming out on September 20th. Here's the show. Hi, everyone. I am really thrilled today to introduce you to my guest, Jane Rhodes Wolf. Hi, Jane. Hey, good morning, Jerry. Thank you. I was looking at your bio on LinkedIn, and it seems like you have done a variety of uh, assignments and worked on a variety of violations. So we're going to have a lot to talk about today. But before we get into that, could you tell me a little bit about you, why you joined the FBI, when you joined the FBI, and some of the assignments that you've had? Uh, Sure. Thank you. So I joined the FBI in 1996. Um, and at that time, I was, uh, it had been a lifelong dream of mine, really, from reading Nancy Drew, Drew books and, you know, just being a, uh, just a curious mind, I guess, over time. And, uh, a good friend of mine growing up, her dad had run our local FBI office, and I always loved Mr. Klemaszewski, whose nickname was Ted the Fed. So it was something that, uh, I had always, always dreamt of doing. And, uh, I was incredibly fortunate. I had been 
stuck in a hiring freeze in the early part of the 1990s, but then uh, success uh, struck, and I started with the Bureau in 1996. So uh, I was first assigned to the New York office and worked very traditional white-collar crime matters, which was uh, exciting in many ways, as New York is the capital of the world in many ways to include financial fraud, so that was exciting. Uh, in 2000, I was deployed when the USS Cole was bombed in Yemen, and that was my first exposure to terrorism at that point. And then, of course, I was in New York on the morning of September 11th and responded to the World Trade Center and ended up working on that investigation for almost two years. So it was an incredibly, uh, it was a great honor to be a part of the, the FBI and really the, the United States response to the, to the terrorist attack. Uh, from there, I worked in our uh, Washington, D.C., in our Congressional Affairs Office, where I saw and understood how the sausage is made, so to speak, and all the government oversight and really learning the Bureau from an uh, enterprise perspective. I then went to Chicago, where I was the supervisor of what we refer to as a Joint Terrorism Task Force, which is a squad that handles all suspicious reporting and initial investigations and develops full field investigations from there. I was at headquarters in our inspection division, and then I went to Philadelphia, a city I know that you love. <laughs> That's the truth. Uh, and I worked there for, for a few years as what we call an assistant special agent in charge. And then I spent the last three years at FBI headquarters in our counterterrorism division, where I was responsible for terrorism financing and also all the threat, threat and risk mitigation matters. So I was fortunate to have seen cases that involve you know, very small dollar loss amounts from a financial fraud perspective, a lot of uh, small suspicious activity things that ran into nothing to really the biggest case that the Bureau has ever worked, and that, of course, would have been the September 11th investigation. So I was fortunate to be a, a participant and a witness to some incredible things. Well, definitely sounds like uh, you have a wealth of information and stories to talk to us about today. So what case um, do we want to talk about first? Sure. I thought this is, a, this is a fascinating case, and this occurred when I was a supervisor in the Chicago field office. So as I mentioned, I was a supervisor of a joint terrorism task force, which is comprised of FBI agents and then state, local, and federal partners. So, for instance, in Chicago, on my squad, I had uh, lieutenants and investigators from the Chicago Police Department, from the Illinois State Police, from the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, the U.S. Marshals, Cook County Sheriff. I'm probably forgetting someone. They'll be mad at me. But uh, generally speaking, it's an important task force that exists in every major city that the FBI runs. So uh, within Chicago, the task force I was responsible for, we responded to all suspicious activity reporting and also what was referred to acts of domestic terrorism. Okay. So in this particular case, as I mentioned, these we would receive these extraneous pieces of suspicious activity. So it's really important for the public to be aware of some of the indicators of potentially terrorism violent activity, or other complex criminal fraud. And maybe another point we could talk about what some of those indicators are. But in this instance, we, the FBI, the uh, New Jersey, I think the Newark office, received a phone call from a chemical company that was located in New Jersey. And the person there had noted something suspicious about this particular purchase, where an individual from Illinois was looking to purchase a material referred to as tetrodotoxin. So I believe it's T-E-T-R-O and then toxin. But what it is, it's a substance that is actually derived from the puffer fish, and it is a neurotoxin which can uh, create paralysis and death as well, too, depending on the, the contact or how it's ingested. Now, this is the toxin, because I, I know about puffer fish. Okay. matter of fact, my, my son did a report on the puffer fish uh -huh. when he was in elementary school. <laughs> but they also eat it, and the thing about eating it is that the chef or the person cooking it must be able to take away that poisonous sack or else every, you know, he's going to kill everybody. Right, and so... Not, yeah, you, not, not appetizing for me. No, I'll think. stick with a good can of tuna, but... <laughs> but here you're absolutely right that there's just a small portion of the puffer fish and not all... 
puffer fish apparently um, hold, you know, uh, carry this poison. So, but what had, and it has very legitimate scientific uses as well too within the medical community and other um, other scientific research area. So this company in New Jersey had received this request uh, ultimately from this person that was identified as Edward Bachner the fourth that he was looking to to make some purchases. So thankfully, this person then contacted the FBI in uh, in New Jersey, who then uh, created what we call a guardian incident, where we track initial suspicious activity. And it was assigned to our squad. So again, based upon the, the composition of the squad, uh, I don't recall which agent had it initially, but we had this this information. And so I will admit I was teased a fair bit within the office that, you know, here I was, I wanted to arrest a bunch of puffer fish or something. So, but, uh, you know, as we know, our office was full of wise guys and I would get, Oh, absolutely. I would get pictures of puffer fish on my desk and all sorts of other, other things. But, uh, well, let me, let me ask you, who is allowed to purchase this toxin? If, if my memory serves correctly, uh, it is used in medical research and, since it is a neurotoxin, there is there are some controls over it. But interestingly enough, at the time, we learned that the controls weren't what one would expect that to be. So, again, within medical research, and I understand some other, you know, uh, uh, biologists and other, other scientific, um, scientific folks are using that as well, too. But okay. it would just be shipped via FedEx or UPS to the ultimate wow. user. Yeah, very interesting. So uh, upon receiving this information, we, you know, we began uh, a, a review to try to understand who was this person that was purchasing the, um, the material and did they have a legitimate reason to do that. And what we ultimately had to determine is if the person who had this toxin, that they had it for a peaceful purpose which is hard to say, <laughs> it's kind of a tongue twister. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that, that was key uh, because, as you well know, Jerry, in our investigations, we need to prove knowledge and intent when we are seeking ultimately a criminal prosecution. But what was most important here is that we wanted to ensure that, that the material was, was safe and it was contained in a, in a safe uh, manner and that the, the public wasn't, wasn't ultimately at, at risk. So the the individual, the subject was using a P.O. box at uh, one of the, I don't remember if it was a, what it was, but one of those, you know, P.O. box type services out in one of the suburbs in, in Illinois. So we had to act very quickly as well, too, because there was the, the person that was attempting to order the toxin was you know, indicated they were in a hurry and was, you know, also potentially looking other places to purchase the toxin. So we acted very quickly within our squad. I think it was probably within a matter of probably seven to 10 days that we went from the initial reporting to uh, to a search warrant and an arrest. And as you know, Jerry, that's that, yeah, that's fast. That, that was yeah, fast. that's moving. Yeah. Yeah. Moving very quickly. And so. Uh, it was it was important that we remain focused on the the safety of the general public and also that it was coming to this uh, PO box. But we knew that it would be shipped in the container that, of course, was safe. But what would happen after that was was a primary concern. So we ended up utilizing you know many traditional uh, FBI investigative tools because we were on a joint terrorism task force. So certainly the concern the outset had been is this some kind of terrorist plot because certainly we know that within those types of threats that have occurred over the years that there is a desire by different terrorist groups to use biological weapons in a terrorist attack so that was our our concern is this part of a larger network is this part of a complex terrorist threat or plot ultimately it turned out that that not what that was not the case because we were able to identify the person that had the address at the P.O. box, and if I memory serves, they, he used a false name there. I think it was the name of a business. And then we were able to, through the legal process, identify the person who had actually made the made the purchases and identified his home that was out in the suburb. Um, I think it, I believe it's Lake of the Lake of the Hills, uh, Illinois. 
And so we began just very traditional uh, law enforcement techniques. We began surveillance. We received uh, issued subpoenas for telephone records and bank records and other any other transactions that may be credit cards and other other ways to determine who this individual was and and what their what their role in it. So uh, during our investigation as well, we determined that the person Edward Bachner, B A C H N E R was not in any kind of scientific line of work. What did he do? You know what? I knew you were just going to ask me that. <laughs> and doggone it, I cannot remember, but I'll see if I have in any of my documents here. If I remember correctly, his, he worked for his family business. I know he worked for his family business, and I believe it was in some kind of financial services, I think. But definitely not a business that would need no. access to a toxin. No, no. So... Um, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm pretty certain he was in the some form of financial services. So uh, that, again, led us to, to recognize that we were dealing with something incredibly serious here. So we weren't ready to go and speak to him. We did not want to approach him until we were able to determine, are there other people involved? Are there other holdings of this toxin that may be present somewhere that uh, we needed to be aware of? So... Uh, very quickly over the weekend, we had 24-hour surveillance, and we were maintaining, um, you know, an eye on him wherever he was and tracking him uh, where he was uh, where he was going. And again, if memory serves, he had gone on a weekend getaway trip with his wife just in the days leading up to uh, leading up to the arrest, which ultimately plays into the story here. Mm. So. Uh, we're prepared. We've been working with the company in New Jersey to, you know, schedule. And, you know, we delayed the shipment a little bit, not just by a couple of days. And so we made the arrangements for the material to be shipped. And then, of course, he knew that it would be at the mailboxes, et cetera, location. I'm not sure if that was the brand, but I think we all know, kind of referring to that generically, that it would be there uh, whatever particular day of the week delivered at an exact time. So we made arrangements. We had an undercover FBI agent posing as the uh, clerk behind the uh, the mail counter, and within you know just a few minutes of us uh, being ready to go, we had our surveillance in place. We'd been surveilling him at the house. We had surveillance at the uh, at the mailbox facility, and he knew that it was to be delivered at let's say ten o'clock or something, and he was there pretty much right on right on schedule. So, so no, not suspicious at all. Not, not at all. Not at all. And I, I remember being in the uh, a business just a door or two down, and you know, we very, you know, just like out of the movies, I would say. You know, we had uh, an undercover agent inside the mailbox place. We had people in cars out front. We had people in the other stores. It wasn't it was in a strip mall, so we can all imagine what that looks like. And no, in walks in walks uh, uh, Mr. Bachner to pick up his package. And he was immediately, upon taking receipt of the box to make sure that the, um, as far as the law was concerned, that he physically had possession of it, which I might add, they did end up shipping an inert form of the uh, yes. of the material. So that's always important to know. Uh, but he was taken into custody just within absolute minutes of that. And without without incident, he was completely shocked and taken off guard that this had transpired. But what did he initially say? Uh, he was just initially. You know, I, I'm not sure I can remember that, but he was he was an absolute he was an absolute shock um, that it, I'm sure he just felt as if he had found himself in the middle of a of a movie or something because he was converged upon by not only um, our undercover agent in the in the facility, but other agents had come in, FBI raid jackets, cars, and of course we had. Um, uh, coordinated with some of the local police as well, too, th- for them to be aware so that they didn't think something else was going on. So uh, utter, utter shock. But then what happened, uh, as soon as we had him in custody, we knew we had to get to the house and conduct a search warrant because, again, to try to make sure that there weren't other people involved or this toxin wasn't in place. But given the fact that we were dealing with this highly volatile and potentially um, fatal toxin, 
that it's my understanding it has to get into your bloodstream for it to take effect, but I don't think any, no one wanted to take chances either <laughs> that there was some other way that you could contact it. So we had a very large team that came in from Quantico, Virginia, from our laboratory, our hazardous material response team, and they were the ones who ultimately uh, conducted the search because everyone had to be in protective gear and had to take the utmost caution as far as uh, protecting um, our agents that were there and anyone who may have been in the home as well, too. So. Right, and you're doing this because he, you know he reached out to this one company, but you're not sure if he didn't contact other companies and have already purchased this toxin or other um, uh, toxins. That is, that is correct. That is correct. So uh, I, if I remember correctly, I think there had been some previous purchases that were not for a peaceful purpose. I'm sorry, that was a little joke. I couldn't stop myself there. <laughs> <laughs> purchase is not for a people purpose. Right, you, oh, see, I, I messed up. I couldn't even I say know. it. I know. I, I had to do an on-camera interview, and I remember I kept on knocking myself in the head, peaceful purpose, peaceful purpose. But uh, anyway, the so then if you can imagine, we're in a nice, uh, you know, a very nice neighborhood out in, you know, suburban Chicago. And all of a sudden, you know, we are shutting down the street. There's FBI hazardous material trucks. There are police officers that are shutting off the street. There's just chaos. Uh, all of a sudden is on this neighborhood. And it was, if I remember, it was about noon. And kids were still in, uh, I believe it was you know, uh, still in the school year. And so here, you know, just imagine you walk out your front door and all of a sudden there's the FBI is taking over your neighborhood. So we probably had, you know, we had to shut down the street from two different areas. You know, again, we were concerned if there was a there was any kind of biological hazard, but also to protect the the crime scene. So, you know, we get to the house and uh, his wife was not home and we ultimately had to enter enter the home and begin the initial the initial search for for any evidence and any of the, the further toxin. So the search itself was really fascinating. The things that that was that we found. Um, wow. It took out. Did he help at all? Did he help at all in 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 the search as far as giving you information as to where you might find things, or was he cooper? Did he cooperate in any way? You know, I'm embarrassed to say I can't remember enough of those details. I believe he had an attorney rather quickly, uh, but we were able to get in touch with his wife and did receive cooperation from her as far as you know, where things were in the house and, you know, where did he work from and, and other things along along those lines. So, uh, but within the house, we uh, recovered many, uh, many different things to include some phony CIA identification. Oh, really? Yeah, in his name where he had comported himself, either he had used it or was going to use it, CIA identification. Uh, he did have a gun. He had many, many knives. Uh, as I recall, he had some other books about disguises and spy and just a, a very curious combination of things that made it look like he was almost trying to be a, you know, a secret agent of some sort. But it was, it was very interesting. And of course, he also had, um, we found a couple of passports as well, too. And other, um, which is interesting, needles and syringes where we believe he had actually done some testing on some animal. Oh, my. And so, believe it or not, I'm sure, Jerry, you've been on many crime scenes, and we ultimately ended up out in the yard digging up a little area. Someone had given us some information, and we recovered some kind of rodent that it was believed he may have tested the toxin on this rodent. So crazy had never been on a search warrant that where we dug up a dead rodent but <laughs> <laughs> wow but this, so he, he so he did his own did his own animal testing that's 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 the way that we understood it yes and um yeah absolutely fascinating but the um but the search took absolutely hours you know on tv how quick it is the fbi rolls up boom in the house not the case yeah. whatsoever especially as we were considering what we had no idea what else could have been in the house if there had been other purchases of materials you know was it booby trapped a whole lot of other things came to mind so it was a laborious um, effort that just took absolutely hours for us to finally get in the house 
And by this time, well, let me let me ask you a question because uh, you know, as a former spokesperson and, and, and media director, <laughs> how long did it take for the media to show well, up? Well, you know, it's funny you say that because I was just about to tell you. It probably took less than an hour because all this, you know, not long thereafter, overhead you could hear the helicopters going off, and there was just, as you well know, just a line of the local. Um, all the local affiliates were there, and um, it turned into chaos very, very quickly with um, helicopters and police presence and media, and then certainly just the neighbors. They were in shock about what had happened. The uh, FBI digging up your neighbor's backyard and recovering dead rodents. So it was, <laughs> it was. I don't want to say a circus, but it was, it was chaos um, at least for moments of it. So. Um, well, it, it does sound like a fascinating scene. So I'm I'm not uh, criticizing the media no, uh, for no, for showing up. No. I mean this this is what <laughs> this is what they do, sure. and this is uh, this is definitely something that the public would be very interested in uh, learning more about. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because if you can imagine, it was you know the ultimate Midwest suburbia, and you know here uh, here we are in FBI raid jackets up and down, and of course we're going and we're speaking to all the different neighbors about, you know, who, you know, who the Bachners were, what did they know about them, had they seen this, had they seen that, and so, yes, we, uh, we disrupted that neighborhood, uh, I'm sure some of them are probably still talking about it to this day, <laughs> but uh, um, I, I, when I laugh, I don't, I don't make fun of, of what could have, um, what could have transpired, and the, and severity of the investigation, but as you well know, as, as FBI agents, and law enforcement officers everywhere, you find yourself in the most absurd situations at time that have the potential to be life and death, and somehow we find a gallows humor in it. So I'm not sure I'm describing that well, but I, I certainly I don't take light anything that could have transpired here. But um, as you well know, we find ourselves in, in bizarre situations sometimes. Oh, absolutely. I, I always like to say, you know, that uh, FBI agents take what they do very seriously, but we don't take ourselves seriously. Oh, that's, you know? that's a perfect way. That's a perfect way to describe it. And if you took things too seriously, you would uh, you would go crazy, you know, because certainly, you know, we've all seen a lot of death. We've seen a lot of people's lives being destroyed, not only victims, uh, but survivors. And then even many times, I think you'd agree with me, many of the subjects we investigated are people that... <laughs> have just screwed up their own life for the dumbest of reasons. So, I mean, absolutely. You know, we're we're ultimately we're a compassionate group, but um absolutely. Anyway, um I would know it, it did just come to mind that Mr. Bachner had uh, purported himself to be a physician and in some kind of either, you know, medical capacity that he was attempting to make those purchases. So that that came back to mind there. So, uh so then throughout the, the course of the investigation, we finally get in the house, and um, I know I couldn't even go in the house for probably four or five hours until we were able to clear it. And then once we got in, we could see in his work area all this assortment of the, the CIA, uh, uh, phony CIA creds, the syringes, the weapons, all these things. Very, very curious, very, um, very disturbing scene. Yeah, this is fascinating. I, I can't imagine what he was doing with it. Did, did his wife have any idea what he was working on? Well, ultimately, what the investigation determined what, was that he was uh, looking to murder his wife with the tox. What? Mm-hmm. All of this mm-hmm. just to get rid of his wife? Yes. So, if you'll rec- so he was in the process of getting some incredibly large um, um, life insurance policies on her that if she were to have died, and especially if she were to have died in a terrorist attack, then, you know, the additional rider. And I'm looking at some, you know, uh, a summary of it that highlights that here he took out a $20 million life insurance policy. On oh, wife. that wouldn't have been suspicious. No. Nobody would have <laughs> no, nobody would have questioned that if she had, if he had been successful and she had died. Nobody would have thought right. anything about him having $20 million life insurance yeah. on his wife. And again, it, he didn't necessarily come, you know, where $20 million may be in a perfectly appropriate amount, but it was not, they did not lead a lifestyle that would have, uh, but uh, interestingly enough, if I remember correctly it had that terrorism rider to the insurance as well too and so one of the other things that we found during the course of the investigation this is fascinating was a incredibly large number of bottles of um you know if you go to something like the body shop or 
uh, one of those places you get all those body lotions and, and shower, shower gels. And if I remember correctly, it was a number, like let's say 20 bottles of a shower gel or a body wash of all the same. And the thought was a commercial, a commercial, commercial body. Uh, you, yeah, but no, I mean, you know, you go to the like bed, bath and or the body shop and you could buy, you know, the, the shower scrubs or the, um, all the different scented body wash from what's the name of the other place. Uh, yeah, I was asking, it wasn't just like a, a plain bottle no. where you would just add things, but something that he would have to empty and then pour something in correct like that like the tylenol scare from way back exactly uh, exactly years ago no, you're following me uh, along those lines so we think that the plot had been to tamper with these different body wash cosmetic uh, materials tamper with them add the add the toxin to that unclear if that would have killed the other people because if i remember you had to actually get the toxin into your bloodstream and just through contact you know, through the skin that may not have done it, may have just made people sick. But the, the what had been put to, brought together in the course of the investigation was that it was going to, at the very least, maybe look like some kind of Tylenol tampering type of situation, ultimately with the goal to murder his wife. So this is absolutely fascinating. Mm-hmm. So what it sounds like you're saying is that if he had been able to go through with his plot, he would have put the lives of many people in danger just so that he could kill his wife and get her life insurance. That's correct. That's correct. Wow. Yeah. That's evil. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was. It was in really um, uh, very, very, very disturbing. Very disturbing as well too, because uh, I love my husband, and when I get cranky with him, that never, that never comes to mind. You know. <laughs> um, so it was very, it, it was very concerning. And what had happened there as well too? Um, he had. Uh, he had a kind of was leading almost like a secret life online as well too, where he had a different website that he had created and they had actually taken some money. I think financially they were, you know, like a lot of people, you know, they were working to get by. They weren't necessarily incredibly comfortable. Um, you know, didn't have a lot of excess money and he had actually, uh, diverted, um, some money from mortgage payments to help pay for the poison. And then of course, you know, the premium on a $20 million life insurance policy is significant. And so there were some false tax returns that had been filed as well, too, because um, as we know from our financial investigations, insurance companies aren't necessarily going to issue a $20 million policy to someone who doesn't necessarily have the financial background and wherewithal to to show that it would be a legitimate purpose. So there had been some false um, tax uh, returns either filed or created and given to the insurance company, which would, of course, was one of the primary um, leads that we were working on as well, too. Wow. Trying to show this great lot, this great life of wealth and other, you know, property and assets when, in fact, you know, uh, I think they were, I'm not sure, I don't remember for sure if they were in arrears on their mortgage, but it was not, it was not that, um, not that manner, which, uh, whatsoever. So, uh, you know, I, I guess that the thing about this, it sounds like that, I, you know, and you can tell us more about his relationship with his wife, but this was all based on greed. Mm-hmm. And, and the money was the most important thing. A lot of times people want to get rid of their spouse because they can't stand their spouse. <laughs> right. But this sounds like it was motivated by greed and money. Yeah, yeah. It, um, it was very, you know, very, very hard to understand. You know, he came from a, a nice, you know, upper middle class family in the Chicago area, had all the you know, everything to, to, that one wants in a, in life, you know, a job, a family, a this or that, you know, didn't necessarily uh, reach the pinnacle that he had envisioned, but, you know, was, was incredibly blessed and fortunate as well, too. But um, the, you know, ultimately his uh, attorney had indicated that, you know, Bachner had been living in a fantasy world and he'd created these that he was trying to escape these lifelong demons and insecurities or something like that. So, um, you know, I think being an armchair observer of uh, human human beings, you know, certainly he, there must have been some other mental health issues or something along the way because it's just, it certainly was ir- irrational, his thought that he could murder his wife, endanger these other people's lives, 
get this $20 million, and then you add on this CIA bogus identification weapons, and as I said, these other books that talked about either, you know, travel or secret lives or changing your identity, just something was right all out of a, uh, right out of a, a, a TV script. You couldn't, you know, you couldn't really believe some of it. Um, and, you know, he also had had some career and financial setbacks, which, you know, who hasn't? <laughs> but uh, uh, it was really, it, it, it was quite amazing, um, quite amazing along the way. Do you have any idea how long he was planning this? Because it sounded like he put in so much effort that it wasn't just a, a you know a month or a couple of weeks or something. That this was something he had planned for a long period of time. Yeah. Um, again, I've been I've been looking at some of the old court documents, and within the uh, the statements from the United States Attorney's Office, it indicates that the plot had gone back till about 2005 at least. So here we're talking three years. Wow. And so, yeah, and they had belonged to a, uh, um, you know, we ended up talking to some of their friends and some of their um, associates and folks they'd gone to uh, church with and other things. And so, you know, we learned more about their lives, and it really was, um, you don't know who you're sitting next to, <laughs> you know, at work or at church or wherever it may be. And it was, uh, many people were absolutely shocked by what had transpired. And so. And so what was the relationship between him and his wife? Well, Did she think they had a good marriage, a loving marriage? Well, she has she supported him throughout the whole throughout the whole thing. Even after finding out what he had planned? Mhm. Mm mm -hmm. So it was um it, you know, certainly she was in shock and and what have you, but throughout the whole thing and even when he was uh, he was only he was sentenced it took many years to sentence him. Uh, but his wife stood by him, and uh, she's even quoted that, you know, she looks forward in a letter that she sent to the judge indicates, quote, looks forward to their future together, end quote. Um, talks about she loves him very much and that she feels safe with him. And so. Wow. Yeah. So, well, that's so what did she think was going on? Did she think that the evidence was was false that the that the evidence wasn't true or did she just forgive him you know I, you know I, I guess I can't begin to understand what she was really thinking but when you look at it in total um, you know clearly she she loved him and I'm sure she didn't want to believe it and took him at his word that he was suffering from some other distress or some other emotional problems and so perhaps those had appeared before and and that was the case. So I don't, you know, you and I can conjecture on how we would feel if that happens to us. So I don't want to necessarily, in fairness to her, put those, um, you know, ascribe some of those directly to her. But it certainly, you know, she she has indicated all along that she loves him and supports him and, uh, you know, ultimately forgive him, for, forgave him for what, what could have transpired, which could have left her dead or paralyzed or you know, something else. And not to mention the threat to other people, other people as well. So um, that is just really a—I hate to use the term "fascinating" because there's so much pain that was associated uh, for Mrs. Bachner along the way as well, too, and for for the family. But it really was uh, an amazing outcome to that to that plot, and not—I don't think anything that m most of us would have felt felt that the same way afterwards. So what happened to him? What kind did did you have to go to trial? Did he plea? Uh, what kind of time did he get? So he had been, um, you know, he of course the day we took him into custody, he remained in custody throughout. He didn't ever make bail along the way, and it took almost four years. So he was finally sentenced in September of 2012, and he got eight years for illegally obtaining a deadly toxin through the mail and plotting to use it as a weapon. So he got eight years for that, which was ultimately, so gosh, he'll be out in four years. So he'll be out very, he'll be out very soon. So mm. yeah, it's, uh, it, it was a, it was, it was fascinating. But what I will say is it showed how important it is for the FBI to receive information from the public. 
and it may be something that we observe at work or that we observe, uh, you know, through a community event or just through our neighbors and sometimes tragically through family members. But it's really important that if there is something that's suspicious, these little tiny pieces of information, and we are incredibly thankful to this woman who worked at the uh, at, at the company in New Jersey that she took the time to report that, to report that information. Because as you well know, many times people are hesitant, they're not sure, they don't want to get somebody in trouble, they're embarrassed, whatever. And so um, it's, it's a really, it's a very positive story in that no one was hurt and that uh, what could have been a very situation was, a, a serious situation was avoided. Now let me ask you, did you find that he had ordered from other companies and had actually received uh Toxin. Uh, I, I believe I believe that is the case. I don't want to answer that for sure because I just I just can't remember enough of uh, uh, those details. But um, I do believe that either through our other records or record searches or at the home, we did find some um, ev- some records at the very least of other you know suspicious uh, suspicious purchases. Um, all right. So going back to what you were saying about people that old see something, say mm-hmm. something, you had initially talked about indicators um, that uh, you'd like to kind of go through. Can we do that now? Sure. That would be that would be great. Uh, you know, as we as we hear about terrorism, uh, many of the indicators there, and especially what we're facing now, is as far as ISIS is concerned, and this effort to. Uh, uh, to recruit and radicalize people here in the United States, uh, a couple things for people to be aware of, and unfortunately, this is happening in suburbia again. You know, we think what happened here in Chicago several years ago. We had a case in the Virginia area not long ago where a high school student was recruiting fellow high school students to travel to Syria to commit jihad. So, a couple things for people to be aware of, and number one, purchase of suspicious items, and that's what this woman did here. So. Uh, depending on what it is, if it may include this purchase of weapons, it may include different bomb making supplies, uh, which could include uh, pipe bomb materials. So it's the the pipe itself and the end caps. There can be different fertilizer purchases, like what of course transpired in Oklahoma City. Uh, there can be other components that, when purchased together. Um, again, weapons with a large amount of ammunition or things that are just out of the ordinary for someone. So certainly there's very, you know, police officers are going to order weapons, other, you know, legitimate um, gun owners and all, everybody who does it legitimately, like, like you and I do to make those purchases, they're not going to be extraordinary or they're not going to be out of the ordinary. So should you see someone in your office, you hear them talking about, oh, I've just bought all this, you know, 500, you know, 2,000 rounds of ammo or something. Those can be things that can be of concern if it doesn't fit with their lifestyle. So suspicious purchases, and that can also include other tactical gear that doesn't align with what they do, be it um, night vision goggles, be it other just tactical clothing, uh, ballistic vests, some of those types of things that are important. If you hear people, you know, just simply expressing interest for ISIS or from other kind of criminal activity could even relate to gangs that is isn't isn't appropriate. That's something for us to be concerned about in regards to terrorism. If you hear people discussing plans to travel to, you know, Syria or Iraq, that is that is an immediate red flag that needs to be reported, because what's happening is the messages from overseas are coming in. And every day there's tens of thousands of Twitter messages and other social media that are screaming to the world to support ISIS. And they're looking for people to listen to that. And even if they only get lucky a handful of times, they've reached potentially someone here in the United States. And the message is come and fight with us overseas. But if you can't come, attack at home and take an action of, of, on your own within your community in the name of ISIS. So that's a grave concern for us. So if you hear someone saying that they're going to Syria or Iraq, and we also have to be concerned about the neighboring countries because Turkey is what's referred to as you know the rat line because many people go to Turkey and then travel into Syria and onto Iraq there. So it's travel to those extreme areas. And also you may see something that is a, a sudden change in someone's demeanor or their personality where they perhaps have become very devout in the manner in which they lead their life, be it 
from a religious perspective. Um, sometimes some of these other domestic groups take a very strident approach to their perspective of the government or other things. So if you see a dramatic change in someone's life that is becoming very, you know, anti-social or, or anti, um, I don't want to say anti-government, that's not a good word, but just, you know, just radicalism. Ra- radicalized. Thank you. That's the word mm-hmm. I was searching for. So those are important. And the thing is, um, there's also in your, when you're in a large event, you know, if you see something, let's say, you know, it's been so hot around here. If I'm at an event today and I see somebody wearing a great big down coat, that's going to concern me because I don't know what they're concealing within their, within their person. If you see someone again in a large, uh, large gathering and maybe they have an odor of chemicals, that's what happened in Germany a few weeks ago. They, uh, there was a suicide bomber. Um, thankfully didn't kill anyone but himself, but they could literally smell the chemicals and the diesel fuel on his body. Somebody that is perhaps getting ready to commit an attack. They might be high. There's a there's been a pattern of people ingesting these amphetamines before an attack. So they may be perspiring. They may be panicky. So these are all things to be aware of. And so and what is that for? Is that to give them some type of a false courage? Yeah, and to, you know certainly just to keep them ramped up so that they have the energy, so that they have just their they're in overdrive. And um, there's a, uh, the name of this drug. There's been a lot written about it. It's called Captagon, and it's arguably that's what they're using overseas for some of the fighters and it just you know gets you high and it gets them gets them moving with you know additional strength and energy and and that type of thing so i think what's most important though if you're at an event and you see something that you think is is immediate response 911 is always the best place to go um, other than that you can contact fbi.gov there's a tips line that is monitored 24 hours a day You can call the FBI. You can call your state and local police. But I encourage people to do that. And don't be worried. Don't be embarrassed um, about submitting it because you're not sure. Let the professionals do that. Um, I will say that when we travel as a family, (laughs) if Uh if I see an unattended bag at the airport, well, old Miss Bossy Betty here, I go right over and I report it, much to the horror and embarrassment of our youngest. So he's, you know, always quick to tell me, that's embarrassing. I can't believe you did that. But, you know, I tell him he'll survive the embarrassment yeah. of that. So, you know, yeah. I think those are some simple things that, you know, and I encourage people to, to read, you know, and understand the radicalization process because it's not only um, impacting the terrorist threat, but in some regards, you know, you could liken it to what's happening, you know, with gang membership as well, too, where people have this false sense of, uh, identity or somehow it's perverted family yeah. connection yeah, all, all these different things so you know those are just those are just some real basic items that come to mind very interesting so you're retired now um i well i'm in the process of my i think we call it our second career so um okay. at the moment i'm doing some uh security work and some security consulting and uh you know trying to figure out a, a you know exactly what the right fit is moving forward could you tell us the name of your consulting company and how people would be able to get in touch with you if they wanted to? Sure. Um, so, yeah, thank you for inquiring. Uh, the name of my company is Division W, and I have a website. People can contact me there, or they can feel free to contact you, Jerry, and pass along my uh, my email to do it that way as well, too. Yeah, I, I will. Uh, what I'll do is in the episode show notes on my website, yeah. I'll make sure to put a link directly to your website. Okay, okay. So, but it's been exciting. Uh, I did a lot of work on the technology side in my last assignment at FBI headquarters in the terrorism program. And so, Could you tell us a little bit about sure. that? I mean, what you can tell sure, us. Sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, for instance, you know, I mentioned the FBI.gov tips line. So, every day we would receive, you know, about 1,500 tips a day that come into the FBI. And many of them are completely useless where, you know, Elvis is alive and aliens landed on my front yard and all sorts of, you know, weird reporting. Uh, But also within that, you know, we were, uh, you know, a small amount, uh, let's say three, four, five percent that we really had to pay attention to that day and work from there. But certainly the volume of the information that we had, it became uh, we had to have someone look at every single one. But then we started to find ways, certainly we hear about big data, data analytics, and, of course, the volume of information we were getting from social media became something that we needed some analytical tools tools to assist us with. So 
um, within those areas, uh, we were working to develop some in-house tools to be able to analyze materials from a, a, a bulk perspective and to highlight where we might see trends to um, examine networks of people who may be in communication with one another. And also, as we talk about the recruitment uh, from ISIS and other terrorist groups within the United States, or can we see who the radicalizer is? Can we see who the influencer is? And we can we see who arguably is the victim in that? Terrorism financing is an incredibly important um, program as well, too, where the you know, working with financial institutions and also money, uh, uh, money service providers and the community in identifying and training people on what to look for, what is suspicious, uh, where to be concerned about particular charities or where to see also the movement of money overseas that, that can be of concern. And is that part of what you're going to be doing with your new consulting company? Yes, I hope so as well, too, because it's really part of the overall, you know, threat identification and related risk management, which in and of itself, you know, I get it might sound kind of boring, but it's really fascinating because there are great clues along the way. And they are indicators for not only terrorism, but for, uh, you know, tr more traditional money laundering that may support um a corrupt criminal enterprise or maybe a corrupt foreign government. Uh, there's also the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act that companies need to need to comply with. It's incredibly important. And then also, you know, the issues as it relates to the in, insider threat at an organization, which in my opinion is just a fancy term for somebody that's a liar, a cheat, a thief, or a spy. And, you know, helping, you know, companies and individuals identify what those indicators are and then to try to get in front of those uh, those issues beforehand. So there's many exciting opportunities uh, out there. Um, see what happens next. Yeah. So when exactly did you retire? Uh, at the end of March. I tell you, I have learned that I do not like working from home. I need to find something that has more structure because it's too fattening. The refrigerator calls my name. <laughs> so now there is my poor husband. There's nothing to eat in our house. So <laughs> uh, no temptation. Temptation, you know. <laughs> so no yeah. and our dog has become extra needy. So yeah, I've got to. I've got to. I need to find something that has a little more structure to it. So we'll see. We'll see what happens next. But. I'm excited. I had I was so blessed to have an incredibly exciting career. I traveled all over the world for the FBI and uh, found myself in situations that I never could have imagined, literally right out of a movie. So uh, it was exciting. I, I feel incredibly fortunate. I worked with great people. Probably the, the greatest honor I had was after September 11th and working with the victims from the attack. Uh, I was on the um, worked down in the, on the death penalty team for the Masawi trial. And there, my job was to review all the 911 calls and to prepare materials for the trial. So we had to play those calls for family members. And uh, that was the, the greatest honor, I think, because in some way, shape, or form, we gave them a, a little comfort and we provided more information for them. And it just is the greatest reminder on, you know, why you did your job, and that's to protect innocent people and to protect our country. So that was the greatest, greatest honor I uh I had while working for the Bureau. And that's the end of the interview. As always, back at jerrywilliams.com, you'll find photos of Jane. There are several links to newspaper articles about the pufferfish poison case. If you enjoyed the episode, I'd like to ask you to share it with your friends and family and colleagues. I make it easy for you. At the bottom of the episode show notes, I have all the social media share buttons. My crime fiction recommendation for this week is not crime fiction. I was drawn to this book. I don't, I don't know why, but I thought it was crime fiction. And a little ways into it, I had to go back to Amazon to look and see how they described it. And they described the book as psychological contemporary fiction. It's called The Bookseller by Cynthia Swanson. But it's about a single woman who co-owns a bookstore in Denver in 1962. She's content with her life until she starts having these very vivid and very real dreams every time she goes to sleep. And in her dreams, she is married and the mother of three. 
and she no longer owns the bookstore. As a matter of fact, she is no longer speaking to her best friend that she used to own the bookstore with. Every time she goes to sleep, she wakes up in the different worlds, her single life and her married mother of three life. And the book goes on and on like that. And it gets to a point where you're really wondering, you're turning the page, constantly wondering what's going on. You know, is something bad going to happen? Is something good going to happen? You know, which life is the real life? And of course, I'm not going to give that away. Uh, I enjoyed the book. Now, I looked over some of the reviews and some people didn't, but I enjoyed it. I thought it was intriguing. I thought it was different. And um, although not crime fiction, you know, it is a psychological drama, uh, you know, a little bit of a suspense kind of uh, book. And, uh, you know, if you're interested in that kind of thing, then you might want to check out The Bookseller by Cynthia Swanson. This episode was sponsored by FBIRetired.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I want to thank you for listening. And I hope you come back again next week for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.